take your Bibles at this time and turn to Luke's Gospel, chapter 19. We're going to read the Scripture, and then we're going to pray in just a moment. And so we're going to turn to Luke 19. And I, I think probably one of a pastor's nightmares is uh, standing to preach the Sunday message at 12.02. But I got to tell you what, haven't you enjoyed the service so far? And if you'll just give me a few moments, I think you're going to enjoy it even more because we're going to hear something about Jesus Christ that's so needful. So we're not going to be long, uh, and uh, I I trust that your heart is ready to receive. And we're going to look in uh, John's Gospel. If you're a guest with us, and I want our ushers, I, I, uh, I don't know if all of our guests receive a bulletin, so bring some down to them real quickly, all this front right section. I want them to at least have the outline. There's going to be an outline inside this. You can follow along with us if you didn't get one of those. Uh, but we're going to read in a moment from Luke chapter 19. I heard about a policeman that had a perfect spot from which to watch speeders. How many of you have noticed they have those perfect spots? Have you ever noticed that? And they hide in there, and, but he wasn't getting any speeders. And so he finally discovered the problem. There was a 10-year-old boy that was standing just ahead of him with a sign that said, Speed Trap Ahead. And about 50 yards past him, there was another little boy that had another sign that said, Tips. So they had a little something going on there. And uh, I, I hope that uh, today uh, we get something from God's Word that will be helpful to us. So Luke 19, I think everyone should have the outline now, verse 1. And Jesus entered and passed through Jericho, and behold, there was a man named, Nicod- named Zacchaeus, which was the chief among the publicans, and he was rich. And he sought to see Jesus, who he was, and could not for the press, because he was little of stature. And he ran before and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he, locked up, he, he looked up and saw him and said unto him, Zacchaeus, make haste and come down, for today I must abide at thy house. And he made haste and came down and received him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all murmured, saying that he was gone to be the guest with a man that is a sinner. And Zacchaeus stood and said unto the Lord, Behold, Lord, the half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have taken anything from any man by false accusation, I restore him fourfold. And Jesus said unto him, This day is salvation come to this house, for as much as he also is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I want to speak this morning from Luke 19.10, the Son of Man is come to seek and and to save that which was lost. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who came to this earth with a mission in mind. And Lord, we pray that you would teach us that mission today and help us to be grateful for what you have done for us, even as we are grateful today for our law enforcement, our first responders. Lord, we are even more grateful eternally so for you. And so teach us this morning I pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. Well, Luke chapter 19 records really one of my favorite stories of the Bible. I remember as a young boy going to Sunday school, we used to sing a song. It went something like this. Zacchaeus was a wee little man. A wee little man was he. He climbed up in a sycamore tree. How many of you remember that song? Anybody else learn that in Sunday school? And I always loved hearing about Zacchaeus in the Bible. And Jesus is passing through the city of Jericho. Uh, He is going to be descending down into Jerusalem, about 18 miles away. And uh, this was a familiar place that Jesus would have seen and uh, would have visited during his earthly ministry, not far from the uh, River Jordan where John the Baptist baptized him. And uh, Jesus uh, knew this area very well. It was here in the River Jordan where he was baptized and where John the Baptist said of Jesus, Behold, the Lamb of God which taketh away the sins of the world. And so here he is uh, near the River Jordan in the city known as Jericho. And uh, Jericho, for those of you that remember the Old Testament story, is where Joshua and his soldiers marched around seven times and the city of Jericho collapsed. And these uh, in the foreground are some of the remaining berms and some of the archaeological relics that were left from the ancient city of Jericho. And so here in Jericho, Jesus meets this man, Zacchaeus. And the Bible says he's a publican. 
uh, that is not a Republican, all right? Uh, a publican is different. Uh, a publican was someone that was the tax collector of Jericho, and the Bible tells us that this man was hated as the tax collector. He had become very rich, and the implication is that he had defrauded many. And uh, so Zacchaeus uh, is a man that was uh, under the scrutiny of the community, uh, had become very, very rich through scrupulous means. And yet, like many throughout that city of Jericho, he wanted to see Jesus. Uh, he perhaps had heard about a man named Bartimaeus who was blind, and Jesus touched him and healed him, and now he could see. No doubt that was something that caused him to have a desire to see the Lord Jesus, and, and uh, he had heard so much about him. But the Bible says something very interesting in John 19, verse 3. It says, he could not see Jesus for the press. Now, I don't know if it was CNN or NBC or what press it was. Come on, help me out here just a little bit. Help me out just a little bit. Uh, it, 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 he couldn't get into him because of the crowd of people and also because of his stature. So here's this short man, not really liked by the community, and he wants to see Jesus, and there's only one way that it's going to happen. He's going to have to climb up into a sycamore tree. Now, I remember years ago visiting Jericho, and Terry and I were there, and we saw uh, some things on the way into the city that made me a little nervous, and sometimes you hear on the news about the West Bank, and literally as we drove into Jericho, there were cars that were, had been set on fire, they were smoking, uh, there were guys just walking around uh, uh, with guns, and, and uh, there was a lot of people yelling and shouting, and there had been some people that were knifed uh, while we were leading this tour in the Holy Land, it had been quite a tense week, so really what you want to do when you're a tourist in a place like that and a time like that, you just want to go from place to place, get on the bus, stay on the bus, go to the places that are fenced and safe, see what you want to see, take your pictures and get back on the bus, which was my plan, especially seeing all of the people on the streets yelling and the cars that were smoking. And we saw some of the ruins of Jericho. We got back on the bus and uh, we were traveling through uh, the city. And my wife, if you know Terry, she's real sweet, she's kind, she's not, not real outspoken about things. Uh, uh, she's not the type of person that's going to tell the bus driver to stop, let's just put it that way. But when we came by the sycamore tree, she just about commandeered that bus and, and she told the bus to stop. You see, she's a, she's a Sunday school teacher, she's teaching the fourth grade girls right now, and she always taught about the sycamore tree, so she wanted a picture of the sycamore tree. So she jumps out of her seat, she tells the bus driver to stop stop. He looks at me. I kind of go like this. He stops. Then she tells me to go out. <laughs> Walk past the men in the smoking cars and take this picture. And so what I want you to know is that I risk my life to take this picture right here to share it with you. I mean, I'm telling you, uh, the toughest guy on L.A. County SWAT, they don't know what I went through that day just to get a picture for my wife and for her Sunday school class. And so Zacchaeus, here in Jericho, I don't know if it was this tree, but he went up into the sycamore tree to see the Lord Jesus. And you know the rest of the story. Jesus said, Zacchaeus, come down out of that tree. I'm going to come to your house today. And I'm so thankful that the Lord Jesus not only came to this earth, but that he's willing to come into the house and even into the heart of sinners like me. People that don't deserve his presence, he comes to us. And he said, Zacchaeus, I know who you are up in that tree. Come on down out of there. I'm going to come to your house today. And when he did that, the Gospels record that Zacchaeus believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And as the story is summarized, we come to this short verse, and I'm going to give you a few thoughts from it. Luke 19.10, where the Bible simply summarizes why Jesus had come. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. I want you to see three truths from this verse before we're dismissed this morning. First of all, I want you to see the identification of Jesus. Who is Jesus Christ? I really believe that when you consider someone as the object of your worship, if you're going to worship someone, you should know who you're worshiping. And who is Jesus Christ? And identification is important. We, we sometimes in life uh, will go through circumstances. We need to know who a person is, what can they do, what is their profession. I think of today, we have different agencies that are represented, and, and they're identified many times by a uniform, whether it's LAPD or LA County Sheriff or Highway Patrol or state penal offices or uh, whether it's a fireman. And, and, and we want to identify so that we can honor, but also in a time of crises, 
Uh, if our house is on fire, we want to call the right department. If we see someone with a gun, we want to call the right department. We identify people so that we know what relationship we have with them. But if identifying people on this earth is important, how much more is it important that we properly identify the one that we say we worship and who lives within us? And it is important. In fact, the Bible says in Matthew 24, 4, Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you, for many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. And we've all heard about various cults, and whether it's the Moonies, some young moon who claim to be Christ, uh, whether it's uh, uh, this uh, Aquino, Apollo Aquino in the Philippines who claims to be Christ, or some of the other uh, groups that we've heard about across this country and around the world. And it's always sad when someone's faith is so misplaced. And I would encourage everyone here today, uh, especially if you've never trusted Christ as your Savior, to study and to consider who He is to know more about the identification of the Lord Jesus Christ. The Bible says, Hereby know ye the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesseth that Jesus Christ is come in the flesh is of God. So how do we identify Jesus from this verse? The Bible tells us here, For the Son of Man is come. He is referred to here as the Son of Man. Now this is a title that speaks of the relationship between the Father of the Son and also including His willingness to come down to this earth and to identify with us. So Jesus Christ is called the Son of Man. In John 1.14, the Bible says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as of the only begotten of the Father. Now, in John 1.1, the Bible says, In the beginning was the Word, that's speaking of Jesus Christ, the eternal Word, and the Word became flesh in verse 14. So Jesus Christ, who was eternal with the Father, who is equal with the Father, when He was born in Bethlehem's manger, took on the form of flesh. He is the Son of Man, uh, and the Bible says that in Him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. So Jesus is not only identified as the Son of Man, but He is secondly identified as the Son of God. And so why do we worship Jesus? Because he's not just another man, but as the Son of Man and the Son of God, we understand that he is God in the flesh. John 5, 17, but Jesus answered them, My father worketh hitherto, and I work. Therefore the Jews sought the more to kill him, because he had not only broken the Sabbath, but also had said that God was his father, making himself equal with God. The Bible says in Philippians chapter 2, that Jesus Christ took the form of God and thought it not robbery to be equal with God. And so why do we worship Jesus Christ? Because He is equal with God the Father. He is God in the flesh. And we identify Him, not as just a good prophet, not as just a good guy, but we identify Jesus Christ as the Son of Man or as the Son of God. One theologian said, you may accept the lofty claims of Jesus, you may take him as very God, or else you may reject him as a miserable, deluded enthusiast. There is no middle ground. Jesus refuses to be pressed into the mold of a mere religious teacher. And many people try to do that. Well, you know, he was a good guy, and you know, all the religions are about the same, and, and Jesus was one of those really good teachers. But, but Jesus gives a much higher standard, and the Word of God testifies to a much different kind of identification when they identify Jesus Christ as the Son of God, as the Son of Man. We recognize that Jesus Christ truly is God in the flesh. 1 John 5.20 we know that the Son of God has come and hath given us an understanding that we may know Him that is true. And we are in Him that is true, even in His Son, Jesus Christ, the true God and eternal life. So we need to identify who we worship. And we need to make sure that we understand why we worship Jesus and not someone else. And we worship Jesus because He is eternal God. And He has presented Himself to us as the Son of Man. So the Bible says here in this wonderful verse, the Son of Man. This is the identification. But then it says, the Son of Man is come to seek. So I want you to see, secondly, the passion of Jesus Christ. We see identifying uh, is important. We see the identification, but what was his passion? Well, notice it. It says, the Son of Man is come to seek. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you as parents have ever lost a child in a shopping mall or at Disneyland, something like that? Am I the only uh, neglectful parent? 
Come on, be honest with me. I lost all four of ours at one time or another. <laughs> I remember having to find Danielle at the Lost and Found at Disneyland, you know. Now, if you've ever lost one of your children, I'm going to tell you right now, especially in a big crowd, you don't care about anything else except finding that child. And that's what the word seek means. It means that Jesus Christ was passionate for you and for me and for this world. And Jesus Christ came to find you, and he wants you to know the love of God. Now, our first responders, I believe, have a passion. I believe when you really get to know uh, men and women that really serve, it's a passion to them. They would, some of them say it's a calling. By the way, I, I believe like if I'm going to go to the doctor and I'm going to get a shot maybe by a nurse, I like to be with one that, you know, this is kind of her passion, it's her calling, not just a job like, yeah, whack, and give you the shot, you know. I like the ones that say, this is going to hurt a little bit. It might hurt a little bit more, but they're kind of walking you through it. They're, they're, they're doing it from their heart. And, and I believe that you'll find that with so many in our law enforcement community. I think we saw that uh, even at 911. We saw the passion that so many had as they uh, served and served with fervency. And we saw it uh, in some of the hurricanes, such as Harvey, and some of these different times as, as uh, first responders came and as with passion uh, they did what they could uh, to bring uh, salvation, humanly speaking. But I want you to see the passion of Jesus. He had passion to seek. In John chapter 10 and verse 11, the Bible says, I am the good shepherd, and the good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. In Matthew 18, uh, we, we hear Jesus talking about if there's a hundred sheep, but one of them goes away, the shepherd will leave the ninety and nine to find the one that is lost. Reminds me of a man that called a house the other day, and a little boy answered the phone, and the, and, uh, and the little boy whispered, he said, hello. And the man said, uh, is your mother there? He said, she's busy. He said, well, is your father there? He's busy. Well, is there anybody else there? A policeman and a fireman. Well, he said, uh, can I speak to them? He said, they're busy. He said, well, what are they all doing? The boy said, they're looking for me. <laughs> I'm telling you, when someone's lost, you're looking passionately. And Jesus said, I came to seek. He came with a passion to seek, but he also came with a passion to love. Now, I said this a moment ago. It's one thing when someone is just doing their duty. It's another thing when they're doing it with a, a heart of concern. And the Bible says that we love Jesus because he first loved us. The Bible says very clearly, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. And so he had a passion to seek for us and a passion to love us. The Bible says, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And that kind of blows my mind because if Jesus is God in the flesh, then he's omniscient. He knew every sin that I would ever commit. He knew every sin that you would ever commit. He knew every sin that would be committed. And yet, even when he knew we were sinners, he died on the cross for our sin. Mayor Rudy Giuliani said at a funeral after 911 something that caught my attention. He said, when everybody was fleeing that building and the cops and firefighters and the EMS people were heading into that building, do you think any of them said, I wonder how many whites are in that building for us to save? I wonder what percentage of blacks are in that building. How many Jews are there? How many of them make 200000 a year or 24000 a year? No, they were saving lives, and all lives are precious, and that's how we're supposed to live all of the time. Well, I'm here to tell you today that if a firefighter would go into a building and risk his life, not caring what kind of a person is there, just knowing that all life is important, how much more so did Jesus think of us? And how much more so does he love you today? And it really doesn't matter where you come from or what your color skin is or what kind of a background you have. What matters today is that the Son of God is passionate about you. He's crazy about you. He loves you. And he wants you to know the love of God the Father. And so we see the identification of Christ. He's the Son of God. And we see the passion of Christ. He came to seek uh, a lost world. But I want you to notice finally with me the mission of Jesus Christ. The mission of Jesus Christ. Now, I like to study uh, mission statements. I like to kind of know what makes an organization tick. And, and, and the best organizations don't just have it on the wall, but somehow they've gotten it into the heart of their folks. And here at Lancaster Baptist Church, we like to say that we exist uh, to love God 
and to grow together and to serve others. That's what it's all about. Loving God, growing together, serving others. And you can study the mission statements, LAPD. Mission statement is this, to safeguard, partly stated, to safeguard the lives and property of the people we serve. Sheriff's Department, a part of theirs, their mission is to enforce the law fairly and within constitutional authority, to maintain peace and order, to work in partnership with communities they serve. The L.A. County Fire Department mission is to protect lives, the environment, and property by providing prompt, skillful, and cost-effective fire protection and life safety services. Every agency uh, should know its mission. But here we find the mission of Jesus Christ. The Son of Man is come to seek, and here it is, to save that which was lost. Why did Jesus Christ come? He came to save lost humanity. Jesus came to save. His mission in coming to this earth was to save the lost souls of men. And by the way, don't ever mistake it. You might take medicine, you might lift weights, you might lose weight, but your life is much more than the body I see right now. You are an eternal soul created by God. And all of us will spend eternity somewhere. And Jesus Christ came to seek and to save the lost. And the word saved means to rescue us from punishment and destruction. For the Bible says that God is not willing that anybody should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Sometimes people said, I just can't believe in a God that would send anyone to hell. It's not God's will that anyone would go to hell. That's why he sent his son, Jesus Christ. And even by one man's sin came into the world. That man was Adam. And death passed upon all men, for that all have sinned. But Jesus Christ, the second Adam, steps into the equation and he shed his blood for our sin and he leveled out the scales of justice, spiritually speaking, so that everyone that believes in Jesus Christ can have forgiveness and can be saved according to the Word of God. Jesus then accomplished everything that needed to be accomplished in order that we might be saved. The Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. Now, please understand this. No one else can save us from our sin. No one else can give us a home in heaven. You can't do it yourself. You can't give enough money. You can't do enough good works. You can't get baptized enough times. Jesus has accomplished everything. And the Bible says, For He, God the Father, hath made Him, God the Son, to be sin for us, who knew no sin. Jesus knew no sin. But He took our sin upon Himself on the cross, and He became sin for us so that we might be made righteous through Him. You see, look, there's nothing righteous in and of myself. I am a sinner, but there is something that has been done for me by God, and that is He has declared me righteous, not because I'm a Baptist, not because I'm a pastor, but because I have received His Son as my Savior, and the Father is pleased with the Son. And when I receive Christ as my Savior, then the blood that Jesus shed is a covering uh, for the sin that I have committed. And the Bible says, neither is there salvation in any other For there is none other name given under heaven whereby we must be saved. And 1 John says this is the record that God has given us eternal life. And this life is in His Son. And he that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son of God has not life. So Jesus came to save us and to give us eternal life. But notice specifically as we close here, notice the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. So Jesus came to save, and he came to save the lost. Now until we see ourselves as lost, we're never going to appreciate who Jesus is or what Jesus did. But the Bible does say that all of us are lost in sin. I think of the prodigal. Some of you heard about the prodigal son. And I think about his father. And when the prodigal came back, the Bible tells us very clearly in Luke 15, The father said, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. In other words, uh, this father viewed his son as away and lost and even dead to him. But now he has come back to him, the father said. And the Bible tells us that we were dead in our trespasses and sin. And that the wages of our sin was death. We were lost in our sin. But we can be saved by the grace of God. God says, even though you're lost, even though you're dead in trespasses and sin, for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourself. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. Friend, I want you to understand that Jesus came to save the lost, that all of us are lost in our sin, for all have sinned, the Bible says, and come short of the glory of God. 
Uh, let me just tell you, I'm wearing a suit. Uh, the sheriff's wearing five stars. It doesn't matter what you're wearing. All of us are sinners. It doesn't matter if you're behind bars or on this side of the bars. We all fall short. None of us reach perfection. There is only one way to have a relationship with God, and that is through His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ. And He will bring us into that relationship much more than being now justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. That is through the Lord Jesus Christ. Now think of that. He came to save the lost. So let me ask you a question. We're almost done. Are you saved? It's not my word. It's a Bible word. It, it's his mission. I mean, if this is why Jesus came, and, and maybe you haven't learned the word. Maybe you went to school and you learned a lot about church history, but not a lot of Bible. I'm not, this is not a trick question. Just asking, are you saved? I mean, on the physical realm, if, if you were brought out of your house that was on fire and you're watching your house burn to the ground and, and you've got a wet blanket around you and a cold bottle of water in your hand, you're standing there and you know that you were just saved by that fireman. You don't have to question that. And you're going to tell your friends, those men over there, they saved me from certain death. You know that you were saved. But I'm talking about your soul right now and I'm talking about the forgiveness of Christ and a home in heaven. And I ask you, are you saved? You see, the wages of our sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And the Son of Man came to bring salvation. So are you saved? Now, all that Jesus did is wonderful, but we must receive, for the Bible says, for as many as receive him, to them gives he the power to become the Son of God. Back on August 30th, 2005, the Coast Guard lieutenant by the name of of, uh, of Ian McConnell was ordered to fly his H-46 helicopter into New Orleans. And the hurricane had come and the flooding was raising up. And on his first mission, he and his crew, flying back and forth throughout the day, they were able to save 89 lives in heroic fashion. 89 lives. In fact, they saved 89 people, three dogs, and two cats. So all the cat lovers can say Amen. But something really weird happened on their fourth mission. Despite 12 different flights into New Orleans, he and his crew were able to save no one. No one. In fact, everybody was on their rooftops, and when they would come by and they would, they would put the ladder down and they would put the basket down, people were saying, no, 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 we got it covered. We're fine. We're going to wait it out. And dozens of those very people through that next night, as the floodwaters rose up, were swept out into eternity because they chose not to receive that basket. And I am telling you, just as surely as that basket was offered to them, a relationship with Jesus Christ is being offered to all of you. And sometimes people have this tendency to kind of look at it and go, hey, I'm good, I'm good. I'm a Baptist, I'm a Catholic, come on, I'm good. I'm a good guy. And well, I'm not nearly as bad as that other guy. I'm okay. It's all good. I'll be fine. You know? And I just want you to understand today that even as someone would have to get into that basket to be saved, that we can't just look historically at, at the identification of Jesus or admire the passion of Jesus, but we must receive him personally to understand his mission we must accept Him as our Savior, for the Son of Man has come to seek and to save the lost. But we must receive His salvation. His identification tells us that He is God. His passion tells us that He loves us. His mission tells us that we have a decision to make. And the Bible says this, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth and believe in thine heart that God hath raised Him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. And that's where the decision is made. It's when someone from their heart says, Okay, God, I confess to you that I am a sinner. And I ask you to come into my heart. Forgive my sin. I believe on you. And I'm not trusting myself or a church. I'm trusting you. And you get into that basket of love. And you accept Christ as Savior. The Bible says, He that has the Son has life. And he that has not the Son of God has life. For whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord shall be, what's the next word say? Saved. You think of it this way, and I want you to see this, just this little picture as we close. You see, 
man is lost and could never come to God on his own. The Bible says all of our good works are like filthy rags. We, we couldn't clean ourselves up enough. So Jesus came. And when someone makes the decision to trust Jesus, then Jesus simply says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by me. His name is Jesus Christ. And he came to seek and to, say it with me, save the lost. But we've got to recognize and we've got to repent of the fact we're lost. And then step into the basket and trust him as our Savior. And when we do that, we are saved. And so let's be in this together. Let's encourage others to know him. And if you're not sure that you know him today, make sure today that you leave this place knowing that you are saved to the glory of God.